Revelation chapter 21 is where we're at today. If you'll open your Bibles there, we are coming into the home stretch of Revelation and in fact of the entire Bible, two chapters left. Great stuff happening here. Major transition in chapter 21, which I'll talk about in a minute. As you're making your way there, just by way of introduction, uh, tell you this. Um, so in 1881, gal by the name of Sarah Winchester inherited over $20 million. $20 million. She, uh, modern day equivalents, that's more than $500 million uh, that, that she inherited back in 1881. And in addition to that, she also inherited a, a, an annual income in, the, in modern equivalents in the amount of $93 million per year. How did she get all of this money? Well, her husband invented the Winchester repeating rifle, what is known as the rifle that won the West. And so uh, this gal hit the jackpot. Um, and what did she do with all her money? Well, Sarah built a house. And uh, when she died, it was seven stories tall and it had 161 rooms in it. It was so large that it took 21,000 gallons of paint to paint her house. But there were severe problems with Sarah's house. Uh, one of the problems was that there was no master builder. Uh, and uh, just take a walk with that. There was no master builder of her house. She determined how the house was going to build. That was the first major problem. Second major problem, and probably the primary major problem, is that Sarah was crazy. Just completely crazy. And, and she was consumed with the thought that all of her money was cursed because of the way in which she got it. That, that it was blood money that, you know, this Winchester repeating rifle responsible certainly for the deaths of, of several. Um, and so she just could not get over that. And she was consumed also with the thought that because it was blood money and ill-gotten gains and so on, that, that her house was haunted that there, there were demons that were after her. Um, and so what she did is she built her house in a perpetual state of construction. And she would every night sleep in a different room to throw the, the evil spirits off that were trying to get her and, and so on. She had all these bathrooms in the house, but really only one worked uh, and, and all. And that was to throw the, 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 the evil spirits off. There were staircases that led to nowhere, rooms that overlooked other rooms, doors that opened to block walls. Uh, and in one particular room, she had this ornate Tiffany glass window. And, and Louis Tiffany personally built this window for her, and it was built in such a way that when the sun shone through it, that this great uh, rainbow uh, prism of colors would, would just scatter and cascade all through the, the room. But she installed it in a windowless room that had no sunlight in it. And, and the window, and indeed really the whole house, serves as a metaphor for Sarah's life. Psalm 127, verse 1, tells us this, that unless the Lord builds the house, those who build it labor in vain. See, Jesus promised in John's gospel, John chapter 14, that we don't have to labor to prepare our ultimate home. He promised us there that he's going to prepare a place for us and that he's going to prepare that place for us and he's going to return to us and he's going to receive us to himself, that where he is, there we might be also. And that place, of course, is heaven. And that is the focus of our study today. It's been said that a Christian's best day on earth is agony and torment compared to the paradise of heaven. However, a non-Christian's worst day on earth is paradise compared to the agony and the torment of hell. And these are our only two choices. You only get two choices, heaven or hell, paradise or agony and torment. The Bible says in Hebrews chapter 9, verse 27, that it is appointed for man to die once, and after this comes the judgment. And when you die, you will be judged, and your eternal destiny will be forever sealed. You will either go to heaven or you will go to hell. And if you were with us last week, you know we looked at that. We saw this judgment known as the great white throne judgment. 
And we saw there in Revelation chapter 20 that um, those who surrender to the rule of Jesus Christ. Jesus, you are Lord. Jesus, I surrender my life to you. Jesus, I believe that you died on the cross for my sins in my place, that there's nothing I can do to, to attain to eternal life. I surrender to your rule so that, Lord, you might save me. And those who surrender to the rule of Jesus Christ, having their sins judged by the past work of Jesus on the cross, their lives sanctified by the present work of Jesus in their earthly life, well, then ultimately they will rule with Jesus. You surrender to his rule, then ultimately you will rule with Jesus. And this is by means of the future work of Jesus Christ, which we are promised, uh, Colossians chapter 3, uh, that, that, listen, there we will be glorified together with Christ. And so this is Jesus' future work with us. The past work, Jesus dying on the cross for our sins in our place. The present work, Jesus sanctifying work in our lives. And Jesus' future work, then he, we being glorified together with Jesus Christ. But if you will not do that, then there is no hope of, of ruling and judging with Christ. In fact, what your expectation then should be is that you will be judged by Christ. Well, we've been seeing a lot of Christ's judgment. We've been seeing a lot of God's wrath as we go through the book of Revelation. But now we turn this page and we get to the last two chapters of this book, the last two chapters of the Bible, and what we have now, God has judged the world. That's over and done with. He's cast the unrepentant into the lake of fire. That's over and done with. And now what we come to is we come to the end and the fulfillment of God's promises to make everything new. Revelation chapter 21, uh, and we pick it up, verse 1. John says, Now I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and also there was no more sea. Now there is a lot of stuff for us to pick up here, a lot of stuff for us to see. And I guess I would begin to introduce this verse this way. If you were with us back on July 4th when we celebrated our 10-year anniversary. And what a wonderful time that was together. And as we did that, we baptized a bunch of folks. We had about 20 people signed up to be baptized, but before it was over and done with, we baptized, you know, 30 some odd people coming forward to make their public confessions of Christ and to be baptized as he commanded. Now, whenever I baptize someone, I, I, I say to them, I baptize you in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Old things are passed away. And then I put them under the water. And then we hold them down there until the bubbles quit coming up. And depending on their sin, how long they need to stay down. I baptize you in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Old things have passed away. And then I bring them up out and I say, behold, all things become new. And the reason I say that is based on 2 Corinthians 5.17, which tells us this. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he's a new creation. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things become new. Can I get an amen on that? Amen. And it's just this promise that we have. Now, this verse, it summarizes the truth that we're all born with a sin nature, but that in Jesus Christ, the old man passes away and, and is replaced by the new man in Christ. That there's this sim symbolism. We go under the water. It's a, it's, a, it's, it's, a, it's a symbol. It's saying we identify with the death and burial of Jesus Christ. And so I go under the water saying that I'm, I'm dying with Christ. And then we come up out of the water. It's a symbol of being resurrected to newness of life. And again, Lord, by my faith in you, I too believe by faith I'm going to be resurrected to newness of life. But listen, it's not just mankind who has been marred by sin and cursed by God. We have to understand this biblically and have the right theology. Not only has mankind been marred by sin, by nature and by choice, listen, all of creation has been marred by sin and cursed by God. Listen to the way that Paul put it in Romans chapter 8, verses 20 and 21. He said this, against its will... All creation was subjected to God's curse, but with eager hope, the creation looks forward to the day when it will join God's children in glorious freedom from death and decay. So Paul says, look, all creation is subject to this curse. Just as man is cursed, the creation itself is cursed, but we look forward 
to the day, as does creation look forward to the day when, when it's going to be uh, set free from, from death and decay. Well, listen, as far as creation is, is concerned, the, the day when it is set free, well, that's what we're reading about here in Revelation 21. That day is here. Now, you need to understand there's about 500 references to heaven in the entire Bible, and 50 of them, 50-ish of them, are here in the book of Revelation. Revelation has a lot to say about heaven. And, and I would just say this, that, that as we look at heaven today, uh, I'm, it's just going to barely scratch the surface as we look at it. We're going to have occasion over the next couple of weeks to look even deeper and to answer more questions about what is heaven and what is it going to be like, and so on. And so... Um, the first thing that we see here, though, is that there's a new heaven and a new earth coming. Now, keep in mind, when the text here says that there's a new heaven that is coming, this is not a, re a reference to a new heaven where God is. When the Bible teaches us about heaven, it does so in three senses. In the first sense, uh, the first heaven refers to uh, the earth's atmosphere, what we would call the blue sky. That's, that's, biblically speaking, that's the first heaven. The second heaven is, is, the, is outer space, what we would call the nighttime sky. And then the third heaven is the place where God dwells in glory. This is where God is in glory, in the third heaven. And so here in, verse tw or in Revelation 21, when it speaks of a new heaven, what it means is a new blue sky. It means a new nighttime sky. It does not mean a new heaven where God is. Okay, keep that in mind. Now, something else to take note of, and this, this might blow your mind, is that God is creating a new earth. God in heaven, in, in the, in the, when we think about heaven, God is creating a new earth. Now, this isn't something that most people realize about the afterlife. A lot of people think about the afterlife. When you think about dying and going to heaven, a lot of people think metaphysically. They're thinking, you know, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be this floating spirit and I'm going to go to heaven and they're going to give me a toga and they're going to give me a harp and they're going to assign me to a cloud and I'm just going to live metaphysically in this kind of sense. Be honest, how many have thought about heaven as metaphysical sense? You ch chickens, you won't raise your hand. So a lot of people don't realize that heaven is, is, is more than that. And, and so the idea of a new earth with a new atmosphere, with a new sky, a lot of people don't realize that's the way it's going to be. And yet, this is a familiar theme in the Bible. There, there, there is, a, we see this familiar theme of a new earth, of a new heaven being created we see it in Old Testament books like Isaiah and the Psalms. We see it in New Testament books like 2 Peter and, and the book here of Revelation. And so the Bible is, it repeats this familiar theme, that heaven is going to consist of, of a new earth and a new sky, a new heavens. One of the clearest references that we have is in Isaiah chapter 65, verses 17 through 19. I'll read it for you. It's the point where I would put it on the screen if we weren't outdoors. So here we go. Uh, I, this is God speaking through the prophet Isaiah. And he says, For behold, I create new heavens and a new earth, and the former shall not be remembered or come to mind. Now, I'll just stop right there. And, and this, you know, we won't get into this. We may, might get into this next week. A lot of people are concerned. They say, well, listen. The Bible says there's not going to be any more tears in heaven. We're going to read that in our text today. It says it here in, in Revelation 21, verse, verse 4. God's going to wipe away every tear from, from our eyes. And so a lot of people will say, well, wait a minute. If I get to heaven and find out that one of my loved ones isn't there, well, how can there be no more tears in heaven? Well, part of the answer to that is right here in Isaiah 65, where it says that the former shall not be remembered or come to mind. When it says shall not be remembered, it is emphatic in the grief, in the Greek, and what that means, it's like it never even existed. You won't know, you will not be aware in heaven, you will not have the capacity to know the former things. So you, you will know and be known the folks that are there, the relationships that you have, the, 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 the things that you enjoy that are good and godly and so on, 
You will know them and there will be that constant knowing in eternity. But in terms of anything that will be passed away, anything that is not God-honoring, anything that is sinful, anything that exists no more, it will be for you like it never existed ever. And, and so there will be no more tears. Isaiah continues. He says, The former shall not be remembered nor come to mind, but he says, Be glad and rejoice forever. Again, this is God speaking through Isaiah. Be glad and rejoice forever in what I create, God would say. For behold, I create a Jerusalem as a rejoicing and her people a joy. Now that's pretty clear about a new heaven and a new earth. So why are Christians surprised by this fact? I'll tell you, probably the confusion comes from misunderstanding certain biblical texts. Uh, 2 Peter 3.10, probably the most familiar text about uh, the new heavens and the, the new earth and, and, and so on, um, and, and what God's going to do with, with the old earth. And it says this, But the day of the Lord, 2 Peter 3, verse 10, The day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night, in which the heavens will pass away with a great noise, and the elements will melt with fervent heat. Both the earth and the works that are in it will be burned up. And, and we talk about this. You've heard me say this, saying, look, you know, don't get too attached to your stuff. It's all going to burn. And, and, and that is true, that, that the things that are, that are not God-honoring, the things that are wicked or evil or whatever, those things, they're just going to burn up. The things that, that, are, that are immaterial to, to the eternal goodness of God, those things are, are going to be burned up. But the last sentence of 2 Peter 3.10 well, it's said to be the most difficult sentence in the entire Bible to translate. And, and if you have different Bible versions, different interpretation versions, the NIV, the New King James, the ESV, the NLT, whatever, what you will find is that there's at least six or seven different words that are used in various translations to define this, this phrase, burned up. When Peter says everything's going to burn up. There's six or seven different translations, and probably what the best translation is, is that the earth and the works in it are going to be found. In the idea, in the sense, they're going to be found out. Now, I'll, I'll explain that this way. Uh, in 1 Corinthians 3, Paul's talking, and he's talking about Christians, when we're saved and we go to the judgment seat of Christ. And he says, but on the judgment day, fire will reveal what kind of work each builder has done. The fire will show if a person's work has any value. Now, this isn't talking about you're going to go to the judgment seat of Christ and he's going to decide, are you going to heaven or are you going to hell? No, that's already been settled. So what's, what's going down at the, at the judgment seat of Christ is he's looking at the works of your life. He's saying, okay, good, you're going to heaven. And now let's, let, now let's assess the things that you did in Jesus' name and let's see if they really were in Jesus' name. And, and Paul goes, look, some of the stuff that you did, it's going to go through this fire of judgment. It's going to go through like wood, hay, and stubble. And it's just going to be burned up. And the Lord's going to say, yeah, that wasn't for me. That was for you. That was sinfully motivated. And, and that is not a righteous work. That gets burned up. But it also tells us that some of the things that we have done in the Lord's name here on earth will go through the judgment seat of Christ. It'll come through as, wood, or as gold and silver and precious stones. And, and God will say, hey, you know what? That was done with a great motivation. That's godly. That's God-honoring. That's going to go through this fire. It's going to come out the other side. And in the same way here, what Peter is saying, he's saying the earth and the works in it are going to be judged by fire. And that everything evil is going to be found out. It's going to be burned up. See, understand this. God created first the first heaven and the first earth for, for Adam and Eve and for for their children and for the, those that would come after them. That's who God created it for. But what happens, you guys know, sin enters into the world. Earth is defiled. Adam and Eve are defiled. And, and so everything then, not only the people, but the physical stuff of the earth, it becomes defiled. This is what Job was talking about when he said, even the heavens are not clean in his sight. And so God promises his people two things. Here's what God promises us throughout the totality of Scripture. He promises us that he will change us, and he promises that he's going to change the heavens and the earth, all of which have been defiled by sin. 
So 2 Corinthians 5.17, he says, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he's a new creation. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things become new. That's God's promise. He's going to change us. But then the psalmist talks about and gives us a glimpse of how God promises that he's going to change creation. Psalm 102, verses 25 through 27. Listen to what the psalmist said. Of old, you, speaking to God, of God, laid the foundation of the earth, and the heavens are the work of your hands. They will perish, the heavens will perish, but you will endure. Yes, all of them, speaking of the earth and, and, and the, in the you know, night sky and the daytime sky, all of them will grow old like a garment, and like a cloak you will change them, and they will be changed, but you are the same, and your years have no end. So in eternity, you will be changed into a new creation, and the earth will also be changed into a new creation. And so the question now comes, well, gosh, what is the new creation? What's the new earth going to be like? Well, we have a lot of clues here in verse 1. There are a lot of clues for us to, 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 to cue in on about what should we expect in the new, of the new earth that God is going to create. And the first clue comes in, in the word first. He, he, he says there, I saw a new heaven and a new earth for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away. So the, that word first used twice. That word first, it's the Greek word protos. We get the word prototype from this. And so that's our first clue, that this earth serves as a prototype for what will be the new earth. The dictionary defines prototype this way. Quote, the, the original model on which something is based or formed, something that illustrates, that's an important word, the characteristics, another important word, of a class or model. Illustrates the characteristics. And so this earth is a prototype of what the new earth is will look like. The, the, this, this daytime sky, our nighttime sky, it's a prototype. It serves as, as the, the illustrating characteristic of what the new heavens and earth will look like. That's the first clue. Next clue is found in, in the word new. He says that he's creating a new heaven and a new earth. That word new, uh, it, it means fresh, it means new in character. It, it, it's of a new quality. Here's what it is. It is unused, okay? God ain't buying you a Hyundai off the corner lot, all right? What he's, what he's creating is something brand spanking new with a new car smell and everything, okay? That is what he's talking about here. So, again, what we're talking about is it's something better. So the earth, the daytime sky, the nighttime sky, it's a prototype, but what he's creating is something better, something brand new. Now, here's our next clue. It's the word earth itself. This word earth, in the Greek, it's the word G, G-E, not General Electric, but G-E. And we, from this Greek word G, we get the word geology. Now, again, going to the dictionary, what's geology all about? Well, the, the dictionary says it's this. It's the science that deals with the dynamics and physical history of the earth, the rocks of which it is composed, and the physical, chemical, and biological changes that the earth has undergone or is undergoing, and we would add as believers, and will undergo in the future. And so what does that mean? What, is this, what does this mean? Here's what it means. It means the new earth is going to be a physical place. It's going to be actual physical tangible dirt, okay? Now, <laughs> again, we don't think in those terms. We think cloud, heaven, harp, like metaphysical. No, it's an actual physical place. Boom, like wow, that's what heaven's gonna be like? Well, yeah, now it's debated with all of this. Are we talking about a recycled earth? Are we talking about an altogether new creation? Like does God just take our earth and then just sort of recycle it, you know? Well, Isaiah 65, 17, we've looked at it, says there God prophetically says there that he will create a new heaven and a new earth. That word create means to create out of nothing, which would seem to argue that it's a brand new thing. 
By the way, it's continual in the Greek. So when God talks about creating a new heaven and a new earth, it's going to be a continual thing, which I don't know, man, but it's going to be awesome, you know? And so there's that, but, but also, so you think, okay, it's new, something that, 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 that he's created out of nothing. And, 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 and so, it, you know, there, there's that part out of it. I, I did a wedding yesterday, and, and I, was, I was talking from Genesis chapter 2 about how God created Eve, brought her to the man. How God created Eve out of, out of Adam's rib. And I make the observation, look, God created Adam out of the dirt. And, and he created the dirt out of nothing, spoke it into existence. So he could have made woman out of anything he wanted to. He chose to make woman out of a rib of man, sending Adam, you know, a multi, multiple of lessons. Hey, look, a, taking a wife is going to require some painful sacrifice in your part, buddy. And, and this is a part of you. It's not like, you know, you're one flesh. That's what you got to get. You know, and, and Adam, he's like, this is bone of my bones, flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she's taken out of a man. God's like, good, you, you're getting the memo. That's the way I've created it to be. Now, so this situation is, he, he doesn't create the earth out of a rib or whatever. He creates it out of nothing. But on the other hand, you know, you read 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verses 10 through 15. Again, there it tells us that everything that, that we do on earth is going to pass through a fiery judgment. And the idea is that the same fire is going to both refine everything that we did was godly and destroy everything that was corrupted all by the same fire. And so it's like, well, gosh, there's, there's a recycling element to it. There's an there's a, a, a altogether new element to it. Here's the best way to look at it. The, the new earth, it's redeemed. That's what it is, just as you are. I like the way that R.A. Torrey put it. R.A. Torrey was the founder of Biola University. And he said this, quote, We will not be disembodied spirits in the world to come, but redeemed spirits in redeemed bodies in a redeemed universe. That's what we have to look forward to. That's what's coming. Now let's deal with this verse for a second that has all you surfers freaking out that there's no more sea. We have Mark Carter here, first service, former professional surfer. I'm like, I know that, that's got you worried, buddy. Some people say, hey, don't worry, this is symbolic. Then when he talks about there's not going to be any more sea, it's because the sea was representative to the Jews especially, and certainly to Mark, as being something that, that was, uh, or not Mark, to, to, to uh, John, as being evil, and, as, and uh, Mark for service, of course, um, as being evil, a place of banishment, a place of, of separation, where we're forsaken. You know, John, the apostle, was on Patmos, uh, uh, this rocky outcrop of an island, barren and forsaken out in the middle of the ocean. And so they're saying, you know, it, it's symbolic of a, of a place like that. You know, you read in the book of Revelation, and the sea is the place that the beast came out of. And, and it's in, Revelation talks about it, it's the place of the dead. And so... Some people go, look, it's symbolic. Other people go, no, 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 this is literal. Like, like in, this, in this neighborhood of scriptures here, we're taking other scriptures that are literal. This is, this is literally, there's not going to be any more C. And of course, the correct answer to this is, is we don't really know. Uh, it's just opinion. I think it's literal. Um, but but here's, what I, here's what I told Mark. If you're a surfer here and you're worried about this, I would tell you, look, I just watched on the news yesterday that Kelly Slater's got this wave pool in Bakersfield, like not even anywhere near the ocean. And it is like a perfect tube. You're watching these guys surfing all over. And if man can create that, I guarantee you what God is going to create is going to blow your mind. Don't worry about the fact that there's not going to be any more, you know, sea or whatever. Hey, the Bible says that in God's presence is fullness of joy. You're going to dig it. I guarantee it. It's going to be amazing. Now, Let's get into to, uh, three particular things here that John continues in on. We're going to look at verses 2 through 8. Let's just read all the way through it. Then I, John, saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men. And he shall dwell with them, and they shall be his people. God himself will be with them and be their God. 
And God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There shall be no more death, nor sorrow, nor crying. There shall be no more pain. For the former things have passed away. And I just pause there for a second and say, don't let this, these just be words that we read. Imagine a place like that. Imagine a place where there are no more tears, none, where there's this fullness of joy, no pain, no crying. God himself personally with his own hand wiping away any tears that you may have had. Verse five, then he who sat on the throne said, behold, I make all things new. And he said to me, write for these words are true and they're faithful. And he said to me, it's done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. I will give of the fountain of the water of life freely to him who thirsts. He who overcomes shall inherit all things, and I'll be his God, and he shall be my son. But the cowardly, the unbelieving, the abominable, murderers, sexually immoral, sorcerers, idolaters, and all liars shall have their part in the lake which burns with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. Now, There's three things to see here in this text. In in verse 2, we see the place for God's people. Speaking of the holy city of the new Jerusalem. Now, John's going to go into this in great detail, starting in verse 9, going through the end of the chapter, and then into chapter 22. He's going to talk about the new Jerusalem. So we're going to look at that more next week. I'm not even going to touch on that here today for time's sake. The second thing we see here, not only is the place for God's people, but we see in verses 3 through 5, we see the presence of God with his people. The presence of God with his people. When God tabernacles with us, lives with us. We're going to look at that in just a second. And thirdly, we see the promise to God's people in verses 6 through 8. The promise to God's people in verses 6 through 8. Now, I'm going to comment briefly on the promise to God's people, and then we're going to finish up just taking a closer look at the presence of God, the the presence of God with His people. So listen, the promise to God's people. What God is saying here as He makes this promise, He's saying, look, it's done. I'm the Alpha, the Omega, the beginning and the end. And look, if you overcome... You're going to share an inheritance with, 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 with me. You're going, to, you're, going to get you, you're going to receive your inheritance. Look, I want you to overcome. I don't want you to be like the cowardly, the unbelieving, the abominable murderers, sexually immoral, and so on. See, listen, here, what God is saying to you, here's his promise. Just boil it down. He's saying, look, heaven and hell are real. They're every bit as real as the chair that you are sitting on today. Heaven and hell are real. And God desperately wants you to know that he loves you, that he's made a way for you to be saved, that if you overcome, look, your inheritance as a son, your inheritance as a daughter, it's waiting for you. And he says there in verse 6, it's done. Now, we're all familiar with Jesus on the cross saying, it is finished. To tell us that, it is finished. What's he talking about there? Well, he's talking about Paying the penalty for the sins of mankind. That that your redemption is done. It's finished. It's accomplished. The wages of sin is death. Jesus said, it's done. I died. Now, what he says here is he says in verse 6, it is done. What's he talking about? Well, listen, in John 14, he said, look, I'm going to go prepare a place for you. And then I'm going to come back for you. And when he says here that it's done, he's talking about that. He says, look, it's all done. Heaven's prepared. It's all prepared. I'm bringing it here. This is what he's talking about. And so God's word to us today is, look, I want to give you a future and a hope. I want to to remind you that the best is yet to come. I want to remind you that heaven and hell are real. And I want to remind you, look, keep pushing forward. It's heaven. It's the reality of heaven and what we have to look forward to. Not some ethereal whatever, whatever is that. No, it's, hey, look, what, what's coming is going to blow your mind. And so God is saying, hey, keep pushing forward. Heaven is what keeps you pushing forward. Heaven is what keeps us looking 
for tomorrow. Heaven is the only place where the deep thirsts of your life are going to be satisfied. Heaven is the place where your <coughs> tears are going to be forever wiped away by God's own hand. I think of the, the lyrics to that Chris Tomlin song. I'll rise when he calls my name. No more sorrow, no more pain. I'll rise on eagle's wings. And before my God, I'm going to fall on my knees. It's this beautiful picture. So that's God's promise. But I want to dial in now and finish up looking at the presence of God with his people. And I'll be quick to this point, but look. We are going to be with God, dwelling with God. The thing that, that is just the most amazing thing to consider. This loud voice in heaven in verse 3 says, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men. This is what we, men has longed for throughout the ages. With men. He will dwell with them. He shall be with his people. God himself will be with them and he'll be their God. He'll wipe away every tear from their eyes. We're going to see as we continue through this next week that, that He is the illumination of this place. There's no, there's no sun, there's no moon there. Jesus Christ Himself is the illumination for us. You know, last week we were saying goodbye to Victoria and Austin. Victoria is a member of our worship team and, and uh, they're moving away. And last week was the last week here and we were praying with them and there were tears and and the parting and all, and, and I was sharing with them an experience that I had had several years ago. And, and several years ago, we, we just went through a season where, where we, had a, we had a lot of people that were, that were moving away, they were leaving the state. Uh, I, I used to joke, I make people so mad they don't just leave the church, they leave the state, you know. Um, but, but we had a lot of people that were moving away. And, and we, had, we had some people that were passing away, and I, I was just having a time of, of broken. It was really broke me emotionally. And I was praying to God. I was actually, I, I was in tears praying to God. And I said, God, why does it got to be this way? Why do we have to have these goodbyes like this? Why can't we all, I mean, we're just, we're a family, and we love each other. And why circumstantially, you think, hey, and the guy can't get a job, and he's got to move away. Why can't we just all stay together? And a naive prayer, I know, but it was just the way I was feeling emotionally. And God spoke to my heart, and I'll never forget it. And he said, the reason you can't all say together is because that's heaven by definition. This isn't heaven. That's heaven. Heaven is the place where we get to all stay together. Heaven is the place where, where we get to enjoy God's presence in an abiding day-by-day -day way where we're with him. And, and, and so, so that's heaven. The people that you love who are Christians, understand you're going to know them in heaven. They're going to know you. The, the godly relationships that you have, you're going to have those in heaven. Only they're going to be glorified. They're going to be perfected without sin. The love you feel here, it's going to be amplified. It's going to be perfected. It's going to be glorified in heaven. The only thing missing in heaven is sin and its effects. My wife celebrated her birthday this week, and I had asked my our friend Rachel Johnson here at the church. Brenda had a picture of her mom that she had taken, and or somebody had taken, and it was just sort of from the back, sort of side glimpse. And her mom's just worshiping the Lord at one of our women's nights out. Her arms raised, sitting in a wheelchair, her arms are raised. We had no idea that would be the last picture of her that we, that we would have. And two weeks later, her faith became fact and she would go to be with the Lord. We had no idea. There's a lot of things that make that sp painting special, but one of the things that makes it so special is the promise that it holds. That at the center of it all, listen, in heaven is God himself. And we're going to see him with our own eyes. I want you to hear these words of Job. Listen to what he says. Job 19 verses 23 through 27. He says, Oh, that my words were written. Oh, that they were inscribed in a book. That they were engraved on a rock with an iron pen and led forever. For I know that my Redeemer lives. And he shall stand at last on the earth. 
And after my sin is destroyed, this I know, that in my flesh I shall see God, whom I shall see for myself. Listen, a day is coming when you're going to see God for yourself. We read about how other people saw God, how Moses encountered God. And we have seen God in, in, by faith through different experiences. We've seen God in tangible ways by the way that he's moved and work. But heaven, we will see him face to face and not be consumed. Job says, in my flesh I shall see God, whom I shall see for myself, and my eyes shall behold, and not another, how my heart yearns within me. I close with this quote from Randy Alcorn. Here's what he says, quote, We were all made for a person and a place. Jesus is the person, heaven is the place. If you know Jesus, I'll be with you in that resurrected world. With the Lord that we love and the friends that we cherish, we will embark together on the ultimate adventure in a spectacular universe awaiting our exploration and domination. Jesus will be the center of all things and joy will be the air that we breathe. And right when we think it doesn't get any better than this, it does. <laughs>